and praise and just ask that the Lord would come and would enjoy what we're going to bestow on him because that's what we're here to do tonight. We're here to bestow grace on him. We're here to bestow our love on him. We're here to tell him thank you for how wonderful he is and how good he is. And so can we just start tonight by doing that? Father, we just welcome your presence into the house tonight. We thank you, Lord, that your word decrees and declares that Anytime two or three gather together in your name, in the midst of them, that's where you will be. If just two or three of us will come together in your name, and Lord, we have gathered tonight in the name of Jesus, the matchless name, the all-powerful name, the name that was given that we can be saved. And so we gather tonight in that name, that name that is the name of the second person of the triune Godhead, that name that encompasses the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We gather together in your name name to praise you and to magnify you. We declare that you are God. We declare that you are Lord. We declare that you are the King of Kings. We declare that you have power over heaven and over earth. And we ask tonight that your power and your presence would just come and fill this house. But Lord, we also want you to be welcomed by our praise. We want you to receive our praises tonight. And Lord, we dedicate our hearts. Would you do that right now, church? We dedicate dedicate our hearts to a time of praise, to a time of celebration, to a time of rejoicing in who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Put both of your hands together and give the Lord great praise in Jesus' name tonight. Amen. You can be seated. Um, at this time, we've got some folks that are going to come and sing some specials for us, and I'm going to come back and bring the word. It's your prayer, 
Come on, give him another good hand clap of praise tonight. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Um, also, if you are in this house, I don't see anybody that might be in that age range, but there is a separate service that's taking place at the Parsonage that is for our college-age kids, and if that's um, in your, in your um, sphere, then you are welcome to go there. Zach's having to go back over there, so just didn't want you to think he had come to sing and then ran off the stage. Um, he asked if he could sing first so that he could go over and be part of that college-age service. But, um, boy, what a wonderful and beautiful song that was. It's your breath in our lungs. Come on, give the Lord another good hand clap of praise tonight. Hallelujah. 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 This time, Sister Jennifer is going to come. She has a, a song the Lord laid on her heart. And um, this morning, I called her out in the hall, and I asked her if she would sing tonight. And she said, Mom was going to talk to you about that, that the Lord had laid that on her heart. And so um, God was a step ahead of all of us, and um, we're, as he usually is. So Sister Jennifer, just come and bless us with song tonight.
First of all, of course I greet you all in the name of Jesus. I really love you guys. Um, but I want to testify. The last time I was here, the pastor challenged my faith. He asked me to sing, and I didn't have a voice to sing. Miss Tanya, this morning got her miracle. I got my miracle that Sunday. My voice is my everything. My profession is broadcasting. My calling is prayer and singing. I cannot do without my voice. And the enemy attacked my voice for a whole month. I could not sing a note. But the day the pastor called me, said, Sister Jennifer, I want you to sing tonight. I said, I just wanted to testify. Now he wants me to sing. The Lord said, now your faith has to be put into action. Well, I came up here and I sang two songs. I, I couldn't even believe myself. But I sang them by faith, and I'm, I'm sure it was not the best voice that evening, those of you who were here. But since that day, I got my voice back. <laughs> now, if you've never been in my position, you'll not even understand how grateful I am. But just imagine, if this is the only tool you have to do what you need to do, you've got to get your voice back. So I do understand, Miss Tanya, what you are feeling. Very frustrating. You want to sing, you can't sing. Now, I wanted to sing this song, but apparently we don't have it on the computer. But there's a song that every morning I have to sing it to the Lord. It says, I have to sing for you. I have to praise you all in the morning. Every morning. I don't care how late I went to bed. The Lord has to wake me up to sing him this song before the birds start singing. Because he says, I'm more valuable to him than a bird. If a bird can wake up to praise him in the morning, I surely can do better than the bird. So when he told me that, I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to praise you all in the morning. So I want you guys to join me. Please, everybody, you're going to stand up. He has saved all of us from the hurricane, and we are all going to praise him. <laughs> Amen. And Miss Anne's number two, yes. I hope you brought your dancing shoes because we're going to dance for the Lord. The Bible says, praise him with dance. Amen. Is that the Bible? Hold on. Is that the Bible, Pastor? I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong. It says we praise him with dance. Yes. All right. I think we're getting ready to obey the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Come on. Let's go. Oh, I love to somebody praise dance. You Please. I love You'll be rewarded by the Lord, not by me. When you I obey him. I 
worship you. And in the midnight, Lord, I worship you. I will worship you, Lord. I will worship you, Lord. I will worship you. Lord, I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. I worship you. Woo! Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. Can I hear hallelujah? Hallelujah. Amen. Woo! Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Can I hear hallelujah? Thank you, Lord. Some parts are in Swahili, African language, but you just sing praise the Lord. Come on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. When I say, I'm going to take you all to Africa so that you can learn how to respond. When I say, pray, in Africa, you say, Praise the Lord. Everybody goes, Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, if you don't want to go to Africa, do it now because. If you don't do it, I'm taking you all to Africa. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. The good. You are a good class. <laughs> Praise God. I'm going to give the microphone back to the pastor unless he wants to sing his special. You want to sing your special? God will fix it. Somebody's ready? All right. Amen. We've got a special, special tonight. Brother Johnny, I got to hear him sing at his mother's um, homegoing service, and he blew me away. This man is an anointed man and has a beautiful voice, and you just obey the Lord. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> well, anyway, let me give like a little story of what happened. Um, I um, spent maybe the last 10 years uh, being my mom's caretaker. And I would like do that seven days a week, closer to 10, year, 10 years. And I did that about seven days a week. So, you know, we, got, we had a chance to know each other very, very well. And so I was the only one that she would allow to call her by her first name, Bernice. So, uh, and, and we had a very close relationship for those years. And uh, my mom passed away in June at uh, Carolina's Hospital. And when she did pass away, I, I was fortunate to be with her because that really was my wish, was that I would be the one that would be with her when she had her final, you know, her final thing. So, you know, I stayed up with her most of the night, was singing her songs, holding her hands, and, you know, telling her things like, you know, I love her, don't be afraid, and that, you know, she'll always be with me, and I'll always be, be with her. And so at her funeral, um, uh, they, you know, I, I made my mind up that I would sing her a song, and the song that I sung to her was the same song that I did for her uh, the night that she passed away, because she passed away the following morning, uh, around 12.40. But anyway, I was there, and I, I know she was, in, you know, in her own way, she was happy and content, so that, that made me feel good. But anyway, the song that I'm going to sing, it's a uh, it's an old gospel song called um, 
Uh, one of my, it, it, it's a song by Reverend Cleveland, and the name of the song is called, well, I tell you what, I'll just sing the song. <laughs> okay, but anyway, I'll try to sing it without music because uh, my tempo might be a little off, but I'll try to do it. Okay. I like moving around. Okay. <laughs> One of these mornings, it won't be long. You look for me, I'll be gone. going to a place I'll have nothing to do just walk around heaven all day when I get to heaven I'll sing and shout nobody will be able to put me out my mother she'll be waiting my father too we'll walk around heaven all day mm -hmm. father above please hear my cry I'm waiting, need you to be my guide. And when my time get a cloudy and gray, I need you, I need you by my side. Oh, 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 oh. every day will be Sunday. Sabbath will have no end. All we'll do is just walk and praise God's name. And when it's all said and done, then the master will say, all said and done. Your job has been done. We'll just walk around heaven all day. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That was beautiful, Brother John. I told him, I told him you could sing. Amen. What a beautiful job that was. Ushers, would you come? Let's get ready to wait on the people tonight for their evening tithes and offerings. And um, as you give, I pray that the Lord will just bless you back in your giving and all that you do for the kingdom of God and for Lake City PH Church in particular. Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity we have to be in your house. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to give. We pray, Lord God, that 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 is given will be used to uh, build the kingdom, build up the kingdom of God. Lord, the lifeline of the church and the kingdom is the tithe. And Lord, I pray that if there be those here today that have not engaged in tithing that they will so do and Lord God if those have already paid their tithes but they want to give above Lord I know that's where the real blessings come and I pray that you'll touch them in their giving tonight in Jesus name amen and amen Amen. All these singers did beautiful tonight, didn't they? Amen. And there's one thing they all have in common that should make you happy. They're not me. Somebody said, boy, pastor says we don't need music, and then he sings five songs. <laughs> well, let's take our Bibles and turn, if you will, to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20 tonight. Stand to your feet for the reading of God's Word, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to be reading verse 26 down through verse 29, and then we're going to go back up and work our way down through this chapter tonight. 
Second Chronicles 20, verse 26. Good to see Brother and Sister Gray in the house of the Lord with us this evening. It's always good to have them in God's house with us. And to all of you, thank you for being here in the house of the Lord tonight. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 26. When you're there, say amen. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the valley of Barak. For there they blessed the Lord. I want you to note that. For there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the same place was called the Valley of Barak, and to this day. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy. Why? For the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies. In other words, they defeated their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets unto the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they had heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. I want to talk to you tonight about celebration and about learning how to celebrate over our victories. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, I ask you tonight to touch me with a touch that makes both preaching and teaching effective. Lord, I pray for the anointing to rest on my life. I thank you, God, for the um, songs of worship that have been sung already tonight. Thank you, Lord God, for those who have lifted their voice and lifted their hearts and lifted their hands to bless you. And God, we have gathered in this place for the purpose of making praise and celebration for the great things that you have done. For you are worthy to be celebrated, and we celebrate you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Blake. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, that's more adjusted for me. Um, celebration, that's what we're here about. That's what this service has been designated for, to celebrate. And I'm asked this to Anna to find the words to this song, this old song that we used to sing that just says, celebrate Jesus, celebrate. I'm not going to try to sing them for you, but I want us to pull them up on the screen. Celebrate Jesus, celebrate. How many of y'all remember that song? Celebrate Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate. Celebrate Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate Jesus, celebrate. Pretty easy, isn't it? That, that's, what, um, that's what we need to do. That's what we are here for. And then it says, he is risen, he is risen, and he lives forevermore. He is risen, he is risen. Come on and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Celebrate Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate. Celebrate Jesus, celebrate, celebrate Jesus, celebrate. And then the next verse says, he is risen, he is risen, and he lives forevermore. He is risen, he is risen. Come on and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Can we do that right now? Can we just do what this song has implied? Can we celebrate the fact that he is risen, he is alive, and he is worthy to be celebrated? We celebrate him with hand claps of praise. We celebrate him with an uplifted hand. We celebrate him with a raised voice voice. We celebrate who he is. We celebrate what he's done. We celebrate his power. We celebrate his glory. We celebrate the victory we have over sin, the victory we have over death, the victory we have over hell. We celebrate Jesus tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate. Tonight I want to look at this story taken here from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's one of those very popular stories. If you have hung around the, um, the, the church very long at all, you've heard somebody preach on the story of Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel going in against these multiple armies that have come against them. You've heard the story of how they went before the um, armies with singing and how when they got to the battle, the battle was already won. And we may talk a little 
little bit about that if we have time. But, but what I wanted to do tonight is I wanted to start at the very end of the chapter and start at the very end of this story, recognizing that the battle has already been won. The, the children of Ammon and Mount Seir and Moab and all of the armies that have assembled together, they are dead. They are dead men. The spoils have already been collected. The war has already been won. What looked like was going to be the destruction and the defeat of Judah has turned around and Judah is victorious. And so we start at the end of the chapter and what do we find them doing? We find them in celebration. A great celebration is taking place as they are celebrating the fact that victory has been won. Can you say praise the Lord to that? Now, if there is anything that the New Testament church has forgotten, I believe is that we have forgotten how to celebrate. In in fact, even some of the um, Acts and and some of the book of Acts and some of the writings of the New Testament, it seems like that the, um, the degree of celebration has already calmed down a little bit when they should have been celebrating greater than anybody else could have celebrated. There should have been a celebration out of New Testament Christians that is beyond anything else any Old Testament um, believer ever would have had. Because think about it. We don't have to sacrifice any goats. We don't have to sacrifice any bullocks. We don't have to sacrifice any lambs. We don't have to make that great pilgrimage to Jerusalem or the temple to bear um, sacrifice to basically put a pin in our sin until Jesus comes. Jesus has already come. Jesus has already already been crucified. Jesus has already been laid in the borrowed tomb. Jesus has already risen on the third morning. The veil has already been written too. If anybody has reason to celebrate, it is those of us that are Christians. Can you say amen? But yet it seems like these Old Testament believers really had us beat when it comes to celebration. And maybe they were more celebrate, celebration-oriented in the book of Acts. But certainly by the time that we move through history and the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of darkness through Catholicism, and even at the beginning of the Protestant movement, what we find is that the, the people found that salvation was by grace and not by works. But really, they had not discovered the art of celebration until the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Ghost fell, it was like they discovered the art of celebration again. If you'll read some of the old chronicles of the great um, camp meetings, both Methodist and Presbyterian, the Holy Ghost fell on those old campgrounds. Camp meeting's not a new thing. It didn't just start with the Pentecostal Holiness Church. Camp meeting's been going on um, since the 1700s and the 1600s. When they came together in worship and in the United States, they would build these campgrounds, these open-air tabernacles, and people would travel from all over. And the old chronicles written, Brother Norman, of of the Presbyterian camp meeting says that the power of God would fall on these camp meetings until there would be a foggy haze that would rest over the campground and the power of God fell even in the Presbyterian church. It is recorded in the Methodist Chronicles that the power of God would fall and people would begin to shake and they would begin to quake under the power of God. And these are the very words that were written. It says that the women's hair would pop like whips under the power of God of God. You know what they learned? They learned how to celebrate. But certainly, after some years of liturgical living, can you imagine being down at the First Presbyterian or the First Methodist this morning and somebody's hair popping like a whip? Could you imagine that happening this morning in any any given church of any kind, really, not just them, but any church of any given kind. Can you imagine that having happened this morning here in the United States? Now we are just, you know, we know how to recite the Apostles' Creed. We know how to start with all the liturgy. We know how to say amen, and we know how to recite, and we know how to repeat. But we have lost the art of celebration. 
And that's one of the things that the Pentecostal movement really reintroduced to the church was how to celebrate, how to shout again. How to rejoice again. How to dance again, Sister Jennifer. How to, how to make noise again. And now, here we are a hundred years after our great movement's uh, beginning. And you know what? We In most of our churches, we're as dead and dry and quiet and, 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 and don't know how to worship don't know how to be lively. I was watching a video this week of a young man, the young man that's preaching for us in November for our Thanksgiving service. He's 16 years old. He was preaching a fiery message about the power of God and the presence of God. And Sadly to say, he was preaching to a Pentecostal holiness church in North Carolina, and they scanned the audience, and the audience looked like they were a bunch of wooden statues. There was no life. There was no excitement to them. They had lost the art of celebration. We've lost the art of how to celebrate the things of God and the Word of God and the victories of God. Oh, hallelujah to God for the celebration that took place this morning. Hallelujah. I said praise God for celebration that took place in this house this morning. We are the children of God, and we as the children of God need to learn to do and celebrate. We need to learn how to celebrate, and we need to learn how to allow celebration. Often, we have victories, both spiritual and physical, and rather than taking time to celebrate, we, it's like we have to move on to the next task. With every victory we have, there ought to be times of celebration. Don't just run on to the next place. Look, stop, take note of what God has done. See, that's what this whole service is about tonight. On Wednesday, we had the most powerful hurricane in all of recorded history that would go above 190 mile an hour sustained winds. The most powerful hurricane in all of history. And all of the all of those smart folks, all of the scientists, all of the meteorologists said it's coming to you, South Carolina. It's going to enter in here to you. And we prayed, and I believe that God stayed that storm away from us, and we've come tonight to celebrate that God did something. God did something. Brother John said last night while we were in prayer, he said, do you realize that he used the term 2.7 million? He's probably right. About 2.7 million church people today across the state of Florida have been displaced. They didn't, have a, they didn't have a church to worship in. Their churches closed and had to board up and had to put on sh- shutters and had to board their windows and, and, and took for higher ground. That's a lot of praise that God didn't get today. It's a lot of folks sitting together. Now, I have to, I have to, take to say, tell you, Brother John, but probably the vast majority of those weren't going to do much praising anyway. They're probably just going to go sit there and listen to some little sermonette and spend about 45 minutes to an hour and get patted on the head and told they were looking good and doing good and going to heaven, and then they got in the car and went and found something to eat. But I do believe there was probably a portion of that 2.7 million that would have offered up God some true heartfelt praise if they'd been in their church today. And this is what the Lord laid on Brother John's heart. He said, y'all need to make up for they're not praising me. Y'all need to, listen, that storm could have come here. And so we need to take some time. We need to take some moments. As Brother Andy said in Sunday school this morning, we need to take some time and praise and magnify the Lord and give him the praise he deserves. We've got to learn how to celebrate victory. I don't know about you, but Thursday morning, I felt like I won a sweepstakes. Amen. I don't know how many of you ever watched the movie The Hunger Games. But in The Hunger Games, there was, you know, they, they, they choose one young person out of all the people. And that person has to go in and fight for food, basically, in the Hunger Games. And, and the one person that gets chosen, oh, it's sad. But all the other teenagers say, whew, I sure hate it that so-and-so is going, but thank God I'm not going. That's kind of the way I felt Thursday. I felt like I'd won the Hunger Games. 
I felt like that, that I had been removed from the contest, so to speak. And we need to rejoice in that. We need, to, we need to claim victory. We need to set time for victory and say, this is a time to rejoice in what the Lord has done. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, we have a really difficult time with this in the church because we're always constantly moving to the next project. We're always moving to the next thing that needs to be done. We're always trying to, to do the next thing that God has on the plate when sometimes what we need to do is stop everything and say, we're not doing anything till we praise the Lord. We're not going to do anything else until we recognize that God showed up and God poured his spirit out and God stayed destruction and God's hand was there. We're not doing anything else till we take a moment to praise him. Come on, praise him if you believe that. Would you praise him with me tonight? Let me tell you this, as a leader, I wear a lot of hats. Thank God for Pastor Mike, I don't wear as many as I did last week, but I have to be a counselor, I have to, I have to be a, a teacher, a preacher, um, I mean just all kinds of hats, a, a janitor at times, a facilitator. A referee, that's one of my biggest jobs, is being a referee. But here's one of the jobs that leaders forget that they have. It is my job to be your cheerleader. It is one of the greatest jobs, and I know some people would disagree with that, and some would say, oh, you haven't been called to be a cheerleader. I beg your pardon, it's my job to cheer you on. It's my job to celebrate with you. And it's my job to teach you how to celebrate. I have said it for years, and it's one of the reasons I sit on the platform. Because the number one praise leader in the church is not the guy leading the singing or the people standing on the platform. The number one praise leader in the church is the pastor. If they don't see me praising the Lord, if they don't see me rejoicing, then how can I ask them to praise the Lord and rejoice? It is my job to show you how to praise the Lord. It is my job to help you enter into praise. It is my job to be the leader of praise and to lead you in praise and to lead you in celebration. And it is my job to cheerlead you on and to help you to celebrate your victories. Years ago when I was pastoring in Florida, my superintendent, he was smart, way smarter than me on so many things and had a very intelligent mind, an analytical mind. He was a great administrator. Man, he was one of the best administrators we have in this denomination. He's retired now and has been for many years, but he was a terrible cheerleader. He was a terrible cheerleader. And I probably have shared this with you before, but I remember one Sunday, just just a, a normal Sunday. We hadn't had a, we didn't have a friend day. We didn't have a pack of pew. We didn't have Easter. It was just a normal Sunday. And for some reason, everybody showed up that day. And we had a lot of visitors that day. And we had 220 people in service that day, which was significantly more than we had had. We had 220 people in church that day. Man, I was so excited. It was the first time the church had had 200 um, for anything in years, and I was so excited. I mean, I was celebrating, and I, was, I called my superintendent. I was so excited to tell him what we had had, and he didn't even take one second to celebrate. He immediately said, well, that's good. What are you doing to assimilate those people? Assimilate them? I hadn't even laid eyes on half of them before today. What do you mean, assimilate them? And he's, he's ready for me to push forward. Come on, it's, that's great. You, you got to push. Now, I understand that thinking. But at that moment, I needed a cheerleader. I needed somebody to come and pat me on the back and say, good job. Y'all are doing a good job down there in Pensacola. You took that church with less than 50 people, and, and it was in a wreck, and you lost 30 of those 50, and, and look at what God has done. I needed somebody to celebrate with me that day. 
the art of celebration. Let me tell you something. Leaders, you need to learn how to celebrate. One of the, one of the reasons outside of the call of God, which of course was the greatest reason, but one of the reasons I wanted to move to South Carolina and work in the South Carolina Conference was because of Jimmy McKenzie. I didn't know Brother Jimmy. I had, I had only met him once or twice. But one of the reasons I wanted to come here was because of Jimmy McKenzie, and it was because Jimmy McKenzie knew how to celebrate victory. And when I called him, I talked to him on the phone one time. And when I hung up the phone, I felt like a million dollars. I felt like I could do anything. I felt like I could conquer anything. I felt like there was nothing that could conquer me because that man who I did not even know did more to celebrate me as a person and celebrate me as a Christian and celebrate the call of God on my life and celebrate the anointing in me. He did more in one phone call than my previous bishop had done in seven years. You see, we've got to learn how to celebrate with people. We've got to learn how to, how to t- you may say, well, preacher, it's not that big of a victory. Every victory is a big victory. Every victory is a big victory. I, I remember another time, I don't mean to talk about the poor fella, but I remember another time we had, um, we had given away our church van. And um, the Lord had blessed. We had just had the storm, that major storm had come through um, 13 years ago. To today, yesterday, made 13 years ago, that storm came through. And um, the Lord had blessed us. The church had almost gone under because of the storm, but God had rebuilt the church back. New people were coming, and a man in the church bought us a um, um, passenger bus, a 25 um, passenger bus, 25 seat passenger bus. So we had this church van, this older church van. And um, we didn't know exactly what to do with it. We could have sold it. Well, we had a brand new church that had just started in another town. And so I asked the church if they'd let us give it away. I got up one morning. I said, can we, I want to ask your permission. I, I, I even bypassed the board. I just said, I want to ask the church's permission. Can we sow this church van into this other ministry? Now, it was another church in the conference. It was another PH church. And the church wholeheartedly, unanimously voted to take that church van and to sow it into that ministry. I was so excited. I was more excited about sowing the church van than I was the passenger bus that had been bought for us. And I told the bishop, I said, oh, I'm so excited. We sowed, we sowed the church van. We gave the church van, to, and I told him the church we gave it to, that new church. That church still uses that van today. I rode by that church when I was in Pensacola um, a couple of months ago. That church still uses that van today. And I remember the bishop, he said, well, my, you must have money just coming out of the coffers. You know, you must have more money you know what to do with it. You're able to, I mean, we need to learn how to celebrate. We need to learn how to celebrate with people. Every victory is worthy of celebration. I don't care if it's big to you, it's big to them. I don't care how big it may seem to you, it's big to them. Listen, I celebrate ministry. I celebrate what God is doing. Brother Gary McDaniel, I celebrate what you're doing. I celebrate the ministry you're doing. Every dollar you raise, every penny you raise, every, um, every event you have, I celebrate you, my brother. I celebrate what God is doing in his life. It's worthy to be celebrated. Amen. After church, almost every Sunday, I mean, and we, do we not have a great Sunday about every Sunday? There, I mean, there's very few Sundays that we leave here that I don't think, boy, this was a great day. This was a great day. The praise team did a great job. The singers did a great job. The musicians did a great job. The people worshiped. I, I mean, about every Sunday that I leave this house, I think to myself, my Lord, I can't get over what you have done, God. And you know what I do? We have a group thread with about 12 people on it. I like to send a text out and say to my praise team and to my worship leader and to my musicians that are working with me to help you, to get you in the presence of God, I just want to tell you guys, you did a great job today. They need to hear that. Patty, you did a super job this morning. I'm not just saying that because I got you in front. You did a super job this morning. Patty, Patty is one of the most unique teachers. She'll, she don't teach but about 25, 30 minutes at the most. 
but she covers everything that can be covered in that 25 minutes. She unturns rocks and stones and looks behind corners and, and looks behind trees and climbs up the tree to show us what's in the tree. And for about 25 to 30 minutes, she spends that time telling us and relating the story and relating the, the lesson. And when she gets through, almost always somebody has something to say. We'll spend the next 10 minutes with somebody commenting and remarking and, and bringing things out and, and put, that's what a good teacher does. They pull the word out of us. You know what, Patty, I celebrate the gift on your life. I celebrate the gift. There's people in this room today, they need to be celebrated. We have lost the art of celebrating victories. Listen, you, you don't understand. If you've never had to organize a service and deliver a service and deliver your heart and deliver your soul, you don't understand. I get through with Sunday and I say, we can breathe. Anna, the screens worked today. All three of them worked today. Hey, Anna, Anthony Cole has already ordered the cards, and he's going to be able to fix that 70-inch TV. He feels absolutely 100% sure he can fix it. We're going to get to have that new 70-inch TV back up there and put that one in the youth room or vice versa. But I'm telling you what, I celebrate that. That might not be a big deal to you, but when we get through a Sunday and we say, all three screens work today, that's something to celebrate. The microphones work. It, they didn't squeal today. We went through a whole service without microphones squealing. You may not think that's a big deal, but I want to tell you, at the end of every Sunday, we ought to have a time to stop and say, thank you, Lord. We celebrate. We celebrate what the Lord has done. No, we're too busy running to the next thing. We're too busy getting to the next service. We're too busy with the next practice. We're too busy laying out the next thing we're going to do. We need to take some time to celebrate what the Lord has done. We know how to do everything else. Let's take some time and give God praise and celebrate him and celebrate his servants. Go with me to Luke's Gospel. The 17th chapter, verse 12. We should have designated times in our services to praise the Lord. Somebody say amen to that. We should have a time to be thankful. We should have a time to announce God's presence. And we should have a time to celebrate God's presence. That should take place in every service, in every, in every church service. And really, Sunday morning is what we call the evangelistic service. And in that service, it is built within that service, a time of celebration, um, a time of prayer, and a time of preaching. And it's, it's the grandest service of the week. And all of that's built within that time. You know, Wednesday night is more about teaching. Sunday school is more about teaching. Even Sunday night, to a certain degree, is about teaching and preaching. But that Sunday morning service, it's so special. We have to pack a lot into it. And we do. We pack a lot into Sunday morning. And in that, there's those times of celebration. But just like we have designated um, prayer services, we ought to have some designated praise services. Thank you, Anna. Half thank you, Diane. Anna, you showed them how to do it. Diane, you were half. You didn't... You didn't commit all the way. You started and you said, uh-oh, nobody else is clapping but me. So you kind of, you have to be like Annie. You got to be fully committed regardless, be fully committed. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that again. And I'm going to pretend as if I did not say it before. Just like we need to have some 
designated prayer services. Maybe I didn't say it powerful enough. Just like we need to have some designated prayer services, we also need to have some designated praise services. <laughs> Hallelujah. That was my fault, not yours. I realize now I didn't say it Pentecostal enough. But we need to have some times, just like we have times that are set up to do nothing but pray. Now, in those prayer times, we do praise the Lord. Just like when we have praise services, there will be some prayer, some petitioning going on. But the generality of a prayer service is not for praise, it is to petition. All 11 of these are petitions unto the Lord. You know, we praise God a little bit for them, but I mean, the vast majority of the time is spent petitioning the Lord. Well, the same way we have times that is designated just to petition the Lord, we ought to have some times that are designated just to praise the Lord. In the scripture that I've read to you from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, they had both. They had a designated prayer meeting. What happened? They get word that Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir and all of the armies that they have, they must have been, I mean, Judah was huge. Judah had a lot of folks. They were an army to be reckoned with. So this had to be a powerful army. This was not just a fly by night army. These are three entire armies, trained, guerrilla, militia. They are people that know what they are doing. These are the Navy SEALs. These are the Marines of that time. They are coming in after Judah. And they get word that all of these renegades, these what, what, what was what small little villages have now merged and have grown into giant armies. They have combined in one strength and their whole intent and purpose in life is to wipe Judah off the books. So Jehoshaphat does what any decent leader would do. He calls a prayer meeting just like I did Wednesday. He calls a prayer meeting, and he assembles all of the people together to pray. He called it a solemn assembly. They came dressed for prayer. They didn't come with their Sunday best. They didn't come with the big hats and the flowers sticking out of them. They didn't come with suits and ties and vests. They came with sackcloth. They came ready to pray. They came with prayer garments on. Maybe they were wearing ephods. But they came to pray. They came to do business with God. See, that, that's the thing. When you come to pray, m most of you know I'm still a little old school, and every once in a while you may see me in a pair of shorts, but very seldom will that happen has to be really hot for that to happen. But when you come on Saturday night prayer, you may see me in a pair of shorts. Now, my shorts are as long as um, most women's skirts, so they would be holiness acceptable. They would, they would pass the holiness code. But, um, but I, may wear, I may wear pajamas. There are times that, um, that on 11 and 30 when we get here that some of us have on pajamas. No, no one at 11.30 has on a three-piece suit. No one. No one at 11.30 is wearing a necktie. No one. No one comes in with a big church hat on. No one. When we get here at 11.30, we have come for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to engage God, to engage heaven, to seek the face of God, to cry out to God. We've come ready to cry, ready to weep, ready to roll in the floor if we need to, ready to do whatever. We have not come to play pretty, pretty. We have not come 
to play dress up. We have not come to display anything about us. We have come to do war. We have come to pray. And the church needs to have designated prayer meetings that that's what we're doing. We have come to pray. We have not come for anything else. We have come to, we didn't come to fellowship. We came to pray. We're good at that. This church is great at that. We have two prayer meetings a week besides services. Every Monday night, every Saturday night, two prayer meetings a week. On top of that, we will call special times of prayer. I have already decided that two Sunday months, two Sunday nights a month, we're going to spend time praying. We're going to pray. We're going to petition God over these 11 things. We're going to begin to seek the face of God to change the atmosphere and to do some powerful things. We're going to have some times of prayer. But let me tell you something else. We're going to, we're going to have some times of praise and celebration too. Because the same way that, that Jehoshaphat called a time of prayer, when victory came, he called a time of celebration. He called the time of prayer when it looked like that the enemy was going to crush them. But when they called the time of prayer and gathered together, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost fell. I love, I love 2 Chronicles chapter 20 because to me it's the first peak of what a real Pentecostal service looked like. They're gathered together, they're praying, they're seeking God, they're fasting, they're calling out for the Lord, and the Bible says that Jehoshaphat leads the prayer. He gets in the middle of the congregation and he leads the prayer. And after he gets through leading the prayer, he's the, he's the pastor, he's the king. He's the pastor. He's the apostle. He's leading the prayer. He's in the middle of them leading the prayer. He's not somewhere waiting for somebody else. He's at the forefront leading the prayer. But while he's leading the prayer, the Holy Ghost falls. And the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel. And Jehaziel stood up in the midst of the congregation and began to prophesy. And he didn't prophesy things like, Oh, you look so good. You're so great. I'm so proud to have you as my child. You're just a wonderful, wonderful person. Now put some money in my hand and go home. No, he said, the battle is not yours. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. The battle is not yours, says the Lord. It's mine. The battle belongs to me. And he said, in fact, I love this part of it. He said, you'll not even have to fight in this battle, but I'll fight for you. But there's something else I noticed today in reading that I, have, I had missed it before. He said, this is where they are. He told Israel or told Judah the location of the army. Now, now you got to catch this. The army, I, I don't know how Jehoshaphat knew, nor do I know if Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir knew that they knew. I don't know. But the indication to me is, is that Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir doesn't really know if Jehoshaphat knows, if Judah knows. So they are coming in to ambush the children of God a sneak attack, and God says, let me tell you where they are. In other words, you don't have to hide from the enemy. They better be hiding from you. But their hiding is futile because I'll tell you where they are. And he pinpoints their location and says, now go get them. But when you get there, I'll have already taken care of everything. And then the Bible says that as they went to battle, they went praising the Lord. They went singing a little song that with something like this, his mercy endureth forever. His mercy. 
mercy, his unmerited favor, his grace, his love for us, it endures forever. And then the Bible says that the angel of the Lord set ambushments against them. Watch it. They thought they were going to ambush Israel. They thought they were going to ambush Judah. But they weren't going to ambush Judah. God ambushed them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to know, Lake City PH Church, the devil thought, hallelujah, the devil thought he was going to ambush us. The devil thought he was going to come at us three different ways and take us with three different armies. But I've come by to tell you tonight that we prayed, and when we prayed, heaven heard. And when we prayed, God fell. And when we prayed, God spoke. And when we prayed, God commanded. And we praised the Lord and God set ambushments against the enemy. Hallelujah. 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 You don't have to hide from your enemy. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You don't have to hide from your enemy. God knows where they are. He knows where you are. He's got all this thing under control. That really is what he was saying. I've got this thing under control. And when they got to where they were going, there was nothing left to do but pick up the spoils. (laughs) They're stepping over bodies. They're saying, look at that change purse. They're stepping over bodies. Look at that necklace. They're stepping over bodies. They look at those rings. They're stepping over bodies. Well, look at that sword. They're stepping over bodies. Look at those garments. They are they are loading the wagons down. Just collecting the spoil. God did the fighting. All they had to do was collect the spoils. But here's here's the here's the thing that I've come to tell you. When they got back to the camp, when they got back to Jerusalem, they didn't just shove the spoils into storage and forget it. They had a designated praise and worship service. And they celebrated the person of God and the power of God and the victory that God had just wrought them. Tell you, church, we need to discover the art of celebration. Let me read this to you. can't believe how my time has gotten away from me, but let me read this to you in Luke 17, verse 12. And as he, speaking of Jesus, entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They had praying down good, didn't they? They knew how to pray. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass as they went that they were cleansed. I don't know how it happened. I don't know if the leprosy just started washing off of them. I don't know if digits grew back. I don't know. I don't know any of that. I just know that as they're going to present themselves to the priest, they look, and there's not a speck of leprosy on any of them. They are all made clean, whole. That's a miracle. That is a miracle. But as they make their way in verse 15, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, stopped. 
and did an about face. He turned back. And with what? With what? With what? You find me anywhere in the Bible where they worshiped and praised quietly. And with a loud voice glorified God. Now, what does verse 16 say? What did he do? He fell down on what? He fell down in his face at the feet of who? Giving him what? And he was a what? Hmm. Verse 17, and Jesus answering said, were there not 10, what's the last, next word? Were there not 10, were there not 10, were there not 10 that all 10 got the same victory? That all 10 were delivered of the same disease? That all 10 were handed their lives back? Were there not ten cleansed? And then Jesus says what I think are some very sad words. But where are the nine? Verse 18. There are not found that return to give glory to God except what? Except this stranger. Where are the nine? There are some things in this story you just have to assume. One is I assume that out of the ten lepers, nine of them were Israeli. Pure, thorough-blooded Jews. No foreign blood in them at all. And one was a Samaritan. A half breed, a Heinz 57, mixed and polluted with the blood of some other land. He wouldn't have even been allowed to be with the other nine if he hadn't have had leprosy. If they were not in the shape they were in, they wouldn't have been with him in the first place. And so he tags alone because lepers are all. Lepers, regardless of whether they're Samaritans or Jews, they're a leper. Their leprosy supersedes their bank account. Their leprosy supersedes their race. Their leprosy supersedes their social standing. Their leprosy supersedes ev- their age. It supersedes everything about them. What they are above anything was a leper. And so Jesus cleanses all ten because they cry out to him in prayer and he says, go present yourselves to the priest. And the indication is, is that when he makes this command, they are all still lepers. But as they walk to the priest, they look at themselves and miraculously there is no leprosy on any of them. Now there are ten men but one of them is a Samaritan and the other nine are Jews. And isn't it sad that sinners will drink together and eat together and socialize with each other, but when we become Christians, we divide by race and social economic standing. Isn't that sad? And so now we've got 10 cleansed men, but he identifies once again as a Samaritan. And he says, there's some unfinished business to do. I've got to go back and give the one who cleansed me the praise that he deserves. In other words, I've got to go back and celebrate the victory in my life. That's all right. Clapping don't scare me. It only scares me when you don't clap. And so when Jesus sees them, 
he says, were there not nine? But yet this stranger, maybe it was that the other nine thought because they were children of Abraham, in some sense of the word, they deserved what they got. Maybe they thought because of their bloodline and their pedigree that they were worthy of the miracle that had taken place. But the little Samaritan said, I'm not even a Jew. I don't even worship at the temple. I got to go back and thank him. And it reminded me of the words of Jesus when he said, to whom much is forgiven, there is much love. Could it be, as I bring this to a close, could it be that somewhere in our mind we have served God so long that we think we deserve the blessings that we get? Could it be that somewhere in our warped thinking that we have walked with Jesus long enough and have put in enough time and service in the kingdom that the blessings we get, we merit, and therefore we don't need to give that praise and thanksgiving. Could that be the case? I don't know, nor do I put that on anybody. I've just made a decision, and I made it not tonight, and I didn't make it yesterday, and I didn't make it last week, last month, last year, or even 10 years ago. I made a decision about 27 years ago when I picked up my first microphone to preach to my first congregation that I would never be part of the nine. I would be the one that came back to giving praise. I would be the one that would never be so dignified that I could not shout. I would be the one that would never be so clean that I could not sweat. I'd be the one that would never be so uppity that I couldn't jump, I couldn't dance, I couldn't lift my hands, I couldn't rejoice. I want to tell you when he observes the church, I never want to be the nine. I want to be the one that came back to giving praise. I want to say Celebrate the victories in my life. Stand to your feet and give him praise. Stand to your feet and praise him. Magnify him and glorify him in this house tonight. Come on, celebrate. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate. He is risen. He is risen. Hallelujah. 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 We need to pray. We do. We need to pray. We need to pray over our finances. We need to pray over evangelism. We need to pray over our country. We need to pray. We need to pray over people in need of divine healing. We need to pray that God save our kids and our nieces and our nephews and our cousins and our brothers and our sisters. We need to pray for the atmosphere. We need to pray that the Holy Ghost fill folks. We need to pray for revival. We need to pray for every leader in our church, every leader in our town. We need to pray for growth. We need to pray. I'm telling you something else. We equally need to celebrate. There is a call, there is a clarion call in the Word of God that we not only need to pray, we need to learn how to celebrate again. We need to learn how to have some desig just the same way we have some designated prayer times. We need to have some designated praise times that we come in this house and you know what we say to everybody? Don't you ask God for a single thing. Don't you ask him to save anybody. Don't you ask him to pay a bill. Don't this time, you can, when this time is over, you can go back and ask him those things. But this particular time, whether it be 20 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour, however much time it is, this particular time, we've not come to ask you of anything. We've not come to petition you. We have come to praise you and celebrate how great you are in our lives. We need to do it every, we need to have some designated times. But every time we get together, 
we need to also spend some time praising him and magnifying him. Yes, celebrate Jesus, celebrate. Go ahead, go ahead, Sister Anna. Can somebody that sings better than me sing? Say, that would be anybody here, Pastor. <laughs> Blake, do you know how to play that? You don't know? It's old. It's old. We need to pull it out. We need to do it again. Listen to all these backseat drivers, Anna. They all know how easy that is. You could just pull it up with a punch of a button. There's no work involved in that. Don't record it. They'll throw us off of YouTube. <laughs> I like the idea, though. I like the idea. Why don't we all take the next 10 minutes? It's almost 730. Why don't we take the next 10 minutes and say till, from now till 740, we're going to spend some time celebrating Jesus. Can you all come stand here with me? Can we come stand here together? Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate. Celebrate his power. Celebrate his grace. Celebrate his glory. Celebrate his salvation.